Chavrin. Thought I'd take a little time to share with you something that I, the Lord revealed to me while I was on Shabbat Live last night. Uh, well, last night for me, I think it was 5 o'clock Eastern. I'd posted 4 Eastern. Uh, forgive me, I get those times mixed up as far as when we were actually beginning. I was thinking we were starting at 10 p.m. Uh, Israeli time, but it was actually 11 p.m. Anyway, though, hopefully you guys were able to figure that out without uh, all my bumbling around. So, but anyway, uh, we had got into a discussion there, and it's actually a very interesting program to listen to if you want to look that up under uh, our Facebook page. You'll see Jason Egroff, um, and uh, it's Revelation News Radio, uh, at Blog Talk Radio, if you want to look that particular conversation up. But there's something that the Lord revealed while we were having the program that was just, it was interesting to me, and I thought I'd share that with you here. Um, take a few minutes of your time and just share that with you. And it kind of deals with being what we call being born again um, as far as the belief in Yeshua as Mashiach. And I was looking back to the Garden of Eden and I, I made the comment, how did you partake of the Tree of Life? Now God had said, there were two, gar two trees in the midst of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, the Eitz Chaim, and of course the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which would be Yodea Ve'ra'ah, uh, Eitz Yodea Ve'ra'ah, which is a, is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course the thing is, of the tree of life, you didn't, you didn't partake of your own will. This was a free gift of God. In fact, Adam and Eve were given this very life of Hashem inside of them when God first made Adam and breathed into them that spirit of life. You know, as we heard, as it says in the scriptures, Nishmat Chaim. See, and the Chaim is the fruit on the tree of life. The Chaim, the Chaim, and the Chaim is what is put inside of them. So it was no works involved at that at all. It was strictly the grace of God that he breathed in there. And of course, Eve, or Isha at that time, or she was not called Eve at the time. She was not the mother of the living. She was Isha, which is a form of God's divine name in the word fire, showing that the fire of God or the spirit of God was inside of her just as it was her husband. And so as we move down in time, uh, and of course the fall happens and God puts the angels there, the cherubs, to guard that way to the tree of life. And the scripture mentions that unless they put forth their hand and partake of the tree of life and live. And the reason why God did not want that to happen was because there was a fallen state. There was sin had come in, and he didn't want sin being able to rule and reign eternally. So God put that block there. Now, interestingly enough, when Abraham comes along, God makes a, an unconditional covenant with Abraham. And I thought that was fascinating, an unconditional covenant. Why an unconditional covenant? Because... It was unconditional in the beginning. And so Abraham is only going to type or foreshadow what Hashem has in mind for the future. And then we get to the time when Yeshua of Nazareth comes on the scene. And you remember there's one place that's recorded in there in the Gospels about him that says that they tried to take and put their hands on him to make him king. This is actually looking back to what God said in the Garden of Eden. Lest they put forth their hand and they live eternally and take, partake of the tree of life. Well, he is that tree of life. And when they were going to take and they tried to take him forcibly and make him king, this is another reason why God knew it would not work. So here the, it's more of a prophetic utterance that God is saying in the Garden of Eden, lest they put forth their hand and they live eternally, because when the tree of life now comes as a redeemer, like Boaz, a kinsman redeemer, they again try to put forth their hands and take of the tree of life, but not the way that God knew they had to do this. 
And so I thought this was just really ironic, but what was it? The redemption had to come. There had to be a price paid for sin. And so therefore, God had required the shedding of blood. And that's why when Yeshua, he died, he released that spirit of God. He was put into a deep sleep as Adam was put into a deep sleep. In this case here, it was death. And of course, no one took his life. He said, I lay down my life and I can take it up again. Something he did of his own accord. And there again, when he rose up, when he seen his apostles, he breathed upon them and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And I thought that was kind of ironic because what did the, what did the early believers do? Well, nowhere do we find where they really do anything other than they believe that he was indeed not only Mashiach, it was God himself manifested in human form. That's what Mashiach really is. And the second thing was, after he had died, after his spirit had been poured out, he said to them, after he said, I, he breathed upon them, wait here until you're endured with, endued with power from on high. See, again, it's, a, it's an unmerited, no works covenant. I'm Stephen Bendeneau, and you're watching Israel Returns. Laila Tov, God bless you.